I think there was a lot of exploration in the 90s. There was this huge grunge thing going on where you went from people that were rock stars, like, you know, you had the Mick Jaggers, and then we get to the 90s, and everybody in a band looked like the roadie. I look at my first album and I think, oh my gosh, I tried so hard not to be, not to project myself as being pretty because I wanted to be taken seriously. I wanted to be perceived as a strong artist, not as some tart or some gorgeous modely, you know, and I think there was a lot of that, you know, with the exception of video starting to become huge with Madonna and Paula Abdul and dancing and that kind of thing, women were you know, out there trying to rock it, you know, trying to be like the stepchildren of Stevie Nicks and Chrissy Hind, and... You had some really strong, very opinionated women in the 90s who were, I mean, Alanis Morissette was definitely somebody who she held her own, you know, without using anything other than her voice and her energy, and that, that was a big thing, you know? So, and Lauryn Hill came out of that, and there was just... There was a lot of um, what I feel like were strong female um, people to look at and say, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I want to be. My early beginnings, I moved to LA and I got some session work. I had a tape of some songs and some demos and I started getting hired to do some session work and I, I got hired to do a record date for Johnny Mathis and I overheard some singers talking about the Michael Jackson tour. So I crashed the audition and I wound up getting it. And then when I came home, there was this, you know, there was this, a lot of attention on the backup singer that had sung for Michael Jackson and a lot of interest in my making a pop record, like a dance, kind of like um, Paula Abdul or Lisa Lisa in the cult jam, what was happening then, Madonna. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do, you know, the stuff I'm doing now. Um, and I had a demo. And after being turned down by every record label, having like played the piano and played the guitar and done gigs and been giving a ton of, um, demo deals, I wound up um, going to a party and giving my tape to a producer, and he got me signed. But what he loved about it was the songs on the demo, um, which had been done basically on a computer. And we wound up making that record, and it did sound much like an 80s kind of sting record. And when I handed it in, I just said, look, you know, we can't put this out. It's just, it's a giant snore. I think you can get it on eBay for like a hundred bucks. It was a really heady time in that, you know, I'd had this album that I I had sort of begged the record label not to put out. And then I sat around for a really long time, went back to waiting tables and started hearing around town that I was about to be dropped. And um, I joined a band called Toy Matinee and I became friends with a front singer who said, hey, you know, we're getting together Tuesday night at um, Bill Betrell's studio, why don't you come out? I went out, I was the only girl, and it was David and David and Kevin Gilbert from Toy Matinee and Dan Swartz, this great bass player, and Brian McLeod, who had been in Wire Train, and just a bunch of people that were extremely talented but that sort of had fallen between the cracks and there was this sort of us against them attitude, like we're, we're so much more talented than what's happening at radio and you know it was kind of elitist and also a lot of conspiracy theorizing and a lot of hanging out in bars till like four in the morning and I just was swept up in all of it and felt like, oh, these are my people. And um, so I went to a couple of Tuesday nights and then um, shortly after that, Bill, the producer said, hey, let's make a solo record on you. We went to the label. The 90s was kind of amazing in that there were a lot of boutique labels that we would remember from like the 60s and 70s that, you know, like Electra and um, Geffen and A and M and Virgin and you know they were the the record labels that carried like the artists like Joni Mitchell and Crosby Stills and Nash and James Taylor and um, you know they really represented artistry and then the big conglomerates started swallowing up the small the small labels. In fact, I was on A and M, which Interscope swallowed up A and M, and I think it became a practice to not you know to give a, a young artist maybe one or two chances and then move on to the next and. My first record, we put out Run Baby Run, which I, I'm not sure even, I'm not sure what it did. And then the second single was Leaving Las Vegas, which I think um, soared straight up to 58. And then the last ditch effort was All I Wanna Do. And then that became like a huge hit. And it, that was not even a song to me that, I mean, that was one that I'd sort of thought we should have left off the album and then it became like the big hit. So, you know, you never know. I was 30 when that first record came out, and it, it's funny because there, there 
you know, the first first few years of, of that, I felt like, gosh, I wish I would have gotten here earlier. I wish I would have been like 18, you know. But as you get older and you become more philosophical, you start to realize if you'd been younger, this these things wouldn't have fallen together. That, you know, who knows what it would have looked like? And would you have been able to hold it when you were 18? Would you have known what you knew? You know, I'd already had real jobs by the time I was 30. Like I had been a school teacher. And so when I actually finally made it, um, it was all about the work, the work, the work. It had to be great, it had to be credible, it had to have legs, be, have meaning. And so I just didn't, I probably didn't enjoy it as much as I could have, but it was what it was and I was where I was because of what I'd already gone through. And, you know, I looked at Stevie Nicks and thought, well, she was 28 or 29. Okay, that's okay. It was interesting. I mean, it was very, for me, very mind expansive to actually work with people and throw in lyric ideas and stuff. I'd never done anything like that. Um, and it was overall a good experience. Um, not sure I'd do it again, but that's because I know more now, you know. Some of the guys in the band were, or in the group were um, resentful that they weren't dragged along as the band. And, you know, initially when I'd asked everyone to come out on the road, they all had their own things going. But I don't think anybody thought the record was gonna take off. So then when it did take off and everybody wanted to be in the band, I'd already, I already had a band that I wanted to be loyal to. And people's feelings got hurt and nobody defended me. That was the other thing. Um, but the band, I mean, the, the album was produced by Bill Betrell, and he did produce it in the way that a conventional producer does produce it, where he dictated who came in and out. It wasn't a jam session. It wasn't a series of jam sessions. It was named that because I wanted to honor the initial start. Um, but, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, but it did burn me. You know, there wasn't anybody that st stuck up for me. And that's why I think the second record did give me the opportunity to sort of clear up some misnomers. <laughs>